this afternoon, we are going to go into the next step in your understanding of the conduct of close range interpersonal confrontations. I think everybody agrees that the marksmanship problem in a street fight or in the defense of your home is often very simple. Now we already, in the amount of time we've been doing it, have been able to get across to a great majority of you sufficient manual skill to handle your weapon. The degree of skill necessary to survive in a lethal encounter is a combination of mechanical and mental preparation. The shooting problem on the street is usually easy. If and we hope it doesn't happen, if you get into a lethal confrontation, the chances are that the range will be short, the target will be large, and there'll be lots of time. That's the normal. Now obviously, uh, that isn't always the case, and so we'd like you to feel that you can handle more difficult shooting problems should they arise. But the fact remains that the shooting part of staying alive is only a part. This presentation may help you in preparing your mind for the contingency of lethal conflict. Mental preparation for combat. And it is combat, of course. Self-defense is combat. The only reason you are justified in reaching for your pistol is because someone is trying to kill you. You don't shoot people for fun. Contrary to what we hear from the press, there is never any indication here or elsewhere that you shoot first and ask questions afterward, or that you, the best way of ending an argument is with a gun. I've heard people say that about us, but that is uh, absolutely contrary to what we teach, and you know it already. But let me go further. <clears throat> let me say that the problem of using your weapon against another living human being is a, an intricate combination of mental and physical factors and it's easier to teach a man the physical than the mental. What happens, for example, when uh, a man who has proven often that he can hit a batch of cigarettes at 25 meters, four times out of five, confronts an armed enemy from here to there and misses him with six shots? And don't think it doesn't happen. A guy with a medal on his shirt, how could he possibly miss a man at arm's length? Well, what happened there was that he was preoccupied. He was thinking about things other than the technical. He was in a, an unsatisfactory mental condition. So what can we do about that? Well, there are several things we can do. We've been working on this for quite a while. And the mental set, the proper setting of your mind for the contingency of deadly conflict is something we have studied at considerable length, we have done something about it, and since we have, we've had feedback. We have had reports back from people from the field, from the street, telling us, yes, it works. It does work. It works because I use it and I know it works. Well, <clears throat> that's what we're talking about now then. The preparation of your mind for that act from which there is no return. Now, let's dismiss for a moment uh, the legal technicalities involved, not because they're unimportant, but because I'm not a lawyer. I would be exceeding my authority in the eyes of all sorts of people if I started giving you legal advice. Besides which, people live in different uh, places, and they uh, are affected by different laws. So I'm not going to go into the law. I'm going to suggest, however, that if death comes to you right there, that you're going to be more concerned about staying alive than you are about the law anyway. Now, regardless of whether you are concerned about the law, let's look at one basic fact, and that is that English common law justifies the use of whatever force is necessary to save your life, even if that force that you use to save your life results in the death of your assailant. And let's start with that and work away from it because that's the basis of it. Whatever it says in your town or your county or your state will be based upon that idea. If someone is trying to kill you, and, or trying to kill your wife or your child, or 
your friend, you are justified in stopping him. And you're justified in using enough force to stop him. Now, you can't take revenge. You can't see what a man has done and said, my God, that's horrible, I'm going to go get him. That is the province of the law. And if you chase a man who has already done a, damage, a damaging act and, and deck him, you may be justified morally, but you won't be justified legally. However, let's look at the moral side. Here again, I'm not your pastor, nor your father, and I'm not going to tell you anything about right and wrong. I'm going to assume that you have ideas on the subject. And I will say this, if you do get into a fight, and you do kill someone, you will have to live with that the rest of your life. Whether it bothers you or not will depend upon whether you think it was justified at the time, not whether I think so, or whether the judge thinks so. So remember, it's a very personal matter. Let's go one step further and dispose of this idea of killing anyway. People insist upon connecting what we do here with the killing of people, you know, like death. Thou shalt not kill, and so on. Let's keep one thing in mind. The purpose of the pistol is to stop fights. The purpose of the pistol is only indirectly to kill anyone. Notice how this happens. Notice how people get hit with pistols and keep right on fighting. That's a failure. Notice other situations where people are hit hard and stop fighting, but don't die. That is a success. And we've got many and many of those. And so our purpose, bear in mind, for all time and for the record, is to stop fights. Stop fights. It must be so important that the fights stop that you actually and literally do not care whether your assailant dies or not. That doesn't mean you disregard the value of human life. It means that your life is more important than his. Because he's trying to kill you and he started it. So that is the state of mind from which you operate. That's your, your basic premise. I don't think I have to ram it any further into your consciousness because you wouldn't be here if you didn't think so. But I wish to make it a matter of absolute clarity so we don't get confused about it at any further point. Now the problem here is the fitting of your mind to the state in which you can do it, which you can do it right, in which you can do the right thing rather than go bananas. There is a tendency on the, person, on the part of a person who's never thought about this before, when he sees that thing right there, when he sees that shotgun pointing right at him, he loses it. Everything goes and he forgets what he's trying to do. We can get in the way of that. And we do it in something like this fashion. The first thing we do is to make up our minds now, Wednesday afternoon, and very definitely and deliberately and on purpose that this thing can come to you. It really can. Now you say, well, <laughs> heavens, I wouldn't be signed up if I didn't know that. Think about it. It can happen. It may happen this afternoon. Before the sun goes down, you may have to use your weapon to save your life. Now just recognize that. Get with that. Make that part of your mind. Now, when I say that, some people are going to say, well, I can't live like that. I'd be bananas. I'd be climbing up the walls. Not so. Not so. It's quite easy to live like that once you've decided that you're going to. <clears throat> you see, the last thought that th countless thousands of good people have had before the lights went out was, oh my God, it can't be happening to me. This is not real. And those very people may have done a lot of time on the range. They may have done a lot of shooting. They may be champions. But when they see it right there, they think, oh my God, it can't be happening. This is unreal. And that's their last thought. Now, if you decide today, before you leave here, that yes, indeed, it can happen to you, you're up on the step. You're off the starting grid and into the first turn. Now you'd think a thing as simple as that would be known by everybody. The fact is, of course, that it is not known by everybody. It is not known. It is not taught. It is not pushed. But that decision is what's going to save your life if it happens. You see, um, what we would like you to leave here with is the ability to look right up the gun barrel and instead of saying, oh, horrors, saying, I thought that would happen someday and I know what to do. 
It's as simple as that. It works. Now, after you have made this opinion, uh, made this decision, and reached this opinion, that it can in truth happen to you today, then you move on to the next stage of awareness, and uh, you can prepare yourself for this by use of what we call a color code. The color code is something I invented about six years ago, and I make no claims for it as to its source in the mind of God or anything. It just seems to work. And we use four stages, and we use four because three would not seem to cover it, and five would get a little bit complicated. And of course, simplicity is always the uh, important thing. The color code is uh, given in four shades, white, yellow, orange, and red. And these conditions applied to your mind refer not to the degree of peril in which you exist, but to the degree of peril which you are prepared to do something about. The colors refer to your willingness to make that irrevocable decision. Are you ready to press the trigger on a live human being? And that is the separation which we use. Condition white, relaxed, unaware, unprepared. <clears throat> white and you are attacked by a deadly adversary, you will probably die unless your adversary is a chump, which he often is. We would prefer to live in condition white, and many of us do. Many people who have no justification do. <laughs> in Rhodesia, some years back, a friend of mine was attending a party, going away party for the head of a machine shop and the uh, Rhodesians of the past used to be pretty serious beer drinkers and there was quite a lot of beer. So uh, my friend came through the door to the warehouse. He reached down and took up two bottles of beer and was opening one when a character came through the door there where an FN automatic rifle pointed at his middle and went <clears throat> so. And my friend looked at him and he said, hi, he says, you want a beer? And the guy goes, click. And he says, I say, you want a beer? And the guy goes, shlunk, shlunk, click. And he says, at that point, I realized that something was wrong. <laughs> well, he lived to tell me about that, but the only reason he did was because that ape did not operate the gun. And that goes on and on and happens again and again and again, you see. Uh, that's condition white. We would like to live in white. It's a comfortable way to be, and in a happier and less turbulent time, we might live in such a condition, but we don't have that choice, huh? So, condition white, relaxed, unaware, and the only thing that'll save your bacon if you're attacked in white is the inadequacy of your enemy. Now, if you move from white to yellow, move to a condition of relaxed alert. And the critical thing about yellow is that it's unspecific. <laughs> By that I mean you are aware in yellow that the problem may come to you but you're not particularly frozen on any particular spot, on any given target. You are generally alert. Uh, you can live on yellow very comfortably for the rest of your life. Uh, it might be said that that's a good idea. Unfortunately, the human personality being the way it is, it's difficult to maintain under conditions that are obviously and clearly safe. I, for example, who teach this sort of thing, find it difficult to maintain yellow here at this ranch. This ranch is the safest place in the world, and I just am not as alert as I might be. But 
I can always shift into alert by a conscious effort when I go to a big town, when I travel, whenever I move out of my own lair, you might say. The <clears throat> thing about, uh, about yellow, you see, is not the, the, the fact that you're in danger so much as it are, is your pre preparedness to do something about it. In white, you'd have to have a conference with yourself to point in and squeeze. You just say, really, honest to God, I mean, uh, are we really got a problem here? About the only thing that would convince you in white would be, would be blood if you'd been hit and shot. And you look down and you saw blood running down your arm and say, oh my God, I really am in trouble. Then you would respond. But it would almost take that. <clears throat> in yellow, on the other hand, you are aware that the world is an unfriendly place, that there are people around who uh, may have nothing against you but are still after your wallet, and you are aware that today may be the day and that before the sun goes down you may press your trigger for keeps. Now you see when you are in that state of mind your ability to pull that trigger is much much easier. It's not that you're getting prickly or in the word trigger happy, not, not at all. What it means is that you are mentally aware of the fact that it could happen today and it could happen before you take your clothes off. It could happen anytime. When you're in yellow, you use your eyes. Your eyes are your alert system. And uh, you never get caught with that head down, sheep-like attitude which invites trouble. Not long ago, they, um, uh, I saw, rather, I saw a treatment in Science Magazine about a study of muggers and muggies, to use a horrible expression. They took <clears throat> 11 felons who were in, in prison for brutal strong-arm robbery, and they showed them films taken on streets and asked these uh, felons to mark on a scale, 1 to 10, of the ones that were easy and the ones that were hard and the ones that were in the middle. And of these 11 uh, <clears throat> goblins, their correlation was almost exact without any uh, doubt or any of anybody's mind, they said, that one would be easy. That one, I wouldn't try. And by analyzing those films, it was quite obvious that carriage, head, and eyes were the things that these creeps were thinking about. The person who stands erect, his shoulders back, his head up, and his eyes open, and watches, and moves well, he doesn't plod, he um, trots up and down steps, and when he stands, he stands on both feet, he's alert, he's balanced. They don't pick a guy like that. Whether he's any good or not isn't beside the point. They just don't choose a man like that because there are plenty of patsies around. So, uh, bear in mind that you, uh, in condition yellow, your alert is general. It is unspecific and it is relaxed. You can live in yellow for the rest of your life, as long as you're awake, of course. Question, should you be armed when you're in yellow? <clears throat> well, it's always comforting, but bear in mind that you don't have to be armed to be in yellow. You are often in yellow when you have no weapon. This doesn't have to do with the fact that you're carrying a gun or not, but it does have to do with your readiness to take action. Now, <clears throat> um, when you move, when you find a target, you make the next shift. You go over to orange, which is specific alert. In orange, you have a target. That tree. There's something wrong with that tree. There's something wrong with that van. And I am going to find out before I shift back to yellow. Now, the, the readiness to use your weapon now picks into a different phase. In yellow, you say it may happen today sometime. In orange, you say it may happen to the driver of that car. You see the difference? It's not the degree of danger you're in, it's the degree of willingness to take the appropriate action. Now, you don't necessarily have to have the pistol out now because many times these alerts that attract your attention are not deadly. They're just the vicissitudes of moving around. But in orange, you say it may happen and it may happen to him. And your ability to make that 
irrevocable decision just picks up to the next stage. And you can hold yellow the rest of your life, but you can only hold orange until the problem which has attracted your attention has been resolved in some fashion. Now, uh, you probably couldn't hold it indefinitely, but you could hold it for hours. Question again, should you be armed? Well, certainly in an orange situation you should be armed if you can arrange it, but sometimes you can't arrange it. Uh, there are hazards to being armed, and uh, we get along with them as best we may, but let's say that certainly by choice you should be armed. Question, should the gun be in your hand? Depends on the circumstance. Now, you have a specific alert here, but you have not made up your mind to do anything specific. You say, it may happen, it may happen. I may have to kill him. I may have to kill him right now, but I'm not, I haven't decided to. Next step. Red is your fighting state of mind, and in red you have decided that yes, you will do it, if. Here again, you are not an uncontrolled, explosive kook. You are in full command of your mind, but you have made the decision that if that man does that, I'm going to do it to him. And what that is, is the mental trigger. The mental trigger, we put it up here, is the decision that you make in your own mind which will trigger your fighting stroke. If he does this, I get him. Suppose you're on a police raid, and this is a very formalized thing, and you open the door quietly on the second floor of an abandoned apartment house, and you see this cat standing at the window, looking out the window with a carbine in his hand. Okay? You've got a situation here. You have a target. You may have to do him. So obviously you're on orange. So you say, you shift over a red and you say, hold it! Now, what's your trigger? Motion. In that case. If a guy just freezes like that and says, all right, mister, you got me, don't do anything, and you say, okay, open your hands and let it drop. You see, you have the situation completely in command. If you say, hold it, and he does this, you have already made up your mind. Your decision has been made and hung on the hook. And that awful choice you have to make has been made. And the degree of skill you have in your hands can be put to use because you know how to shoot. You can hit that light switch. You know you can. You have done it. The decision as to whether or not has already been made. You say, if you don't drop your gun, I'm going to do it. He doesn't drop it. Many things like that. You see, the trigger is always in your mind. You don't know what's, gonna, what's going to... Uh, trigger you in general, but you make up your mind in advance. In the rather well, awful uh, Newhall thing that uh, I mentioned before, where four highway patrolmen were killed by two felons, when the first car made the stop and the driver officer got on the left side and called upon the man in the front to get out, the, the officer on the right side got out with a shotgun in his hands and stood there with a the shotgun at high port well, that bird got out and shot him in the chest twice with 357. Now, you can't say that that young man was not properly armed. I mean, between two cars parked pretty close together, there's hardly anything better than a shotgun, huh? You can't say he couldn't hit because he didn't try to hit. He stood there in amazement while this guy killed him. Now, how long do you suppose it takes for a man to open a car door and step out and put his foot on the ground? A long time. Certainly a lot longer than it takes to do that. So what killed this black guy? Not bad training, not the fact that he didn't know how to shoot, not the fact that he had the wrong gun, but the fact that he didn't know this. That killed him, the lack of that. Now that's what we're talking about. Your decision has been made, and you say, if this, then that. Now one of our faculty members here, not on this particular school, but one who comes here, comes here frequently, and this happened to him. He went home after he'd been here, and in his gun shop, uh, he was confronted by a customer who asked him for some information. He turned to receive the information. He turned around and looked right at the muzzle of a 38 Charter right there, pointing at his nose. Now, he, uh, being a, uh, a good student, he was on yellow because he was in his house, and he was in his gun store, and he had his pistol on. And so when he saw that pistol, instead of saying, Jesus Christ, he said, ah, I thought this might happen. So he says, hey, and looked at the door. The guy swings the pistol that way. John came out like that. 
and said, hold it right there, mister. Don't move anything at all. Don't even hiccup. Don't breathe. And he told me he had two pounds pressure on a four-pound trigger. <laughs> and the range was about 18 inches. <laughs> and he said, you so much as hiccup and that your head will be all over the far wall. So now, easy does it. Open your hand and let the gun drop. And everything was cool. You know, an interesting thing about that was the state of excitement that John was in because uh, he told uh, several people later, asked, why didn't you bust this bird, you know? But they'll turn him loose or, or immediately and he'll do it to somebody else who can't handle himself. And John said, well, you know, I, I don't mind. I mean, I'm not a humanitarian. I don't care whether that clown is alive or dead. In fact, I think you're right. He probably would be better off dead. But I didn't feel any tension. I wasn't excited. I was in complete charge. And so I didn't fire because I didn't feel any pressure. The important thing about this degree of mental preparedness is the fact that it avoids difficulties. We're often accused of teaching people to shoot quickly. You know, we're, we're experts. We shoot well. We shoot cleanly. We shoot fast. Therefore, we are some kind of buzzsaw. Wrong. The more confidence you have, the more confidence you feel, both in your weapon and in your, in your degree of confidence to handle a tactical situation, the less likely you are to shoot. Coming in waving a pistol around because you're afraid somebody may beat you to the draw provokes trouble. Coming in in complete command and saying, you have lost the fight, mister, so you better admit it now, and knowing that you can handle it is great. Remember that when a felon points a weapon at you and gives you an order, he expects to be obeyed. When he is not obeyed, there is a short circuit in his mental pattern. Keep that in mind. It's not a reaction time thing. He says, lie down on the floor. He'd say, lay down on the floor. And when you reach for your pistol, he says, you didn't hear me. I said to lay down on the floor. And maybe he never finishes the sentence. Works. It works. He says, do this. And you say, bang. And he says, you didn't hear what I said. Don't feel that beating the drop is any kind of masterpiece of magicianry with your hand. It is not. It is simply deliberation and understanding of the problem. The felon expects to be obeyed, and he has to wait long enough to find out whether you're going to obey him. And in that interval, you have time to do all sorts of things. Probably you have time when you get finished with this afternoon's drill to come out and hit twice, reload, and hit twice again. By the time he's made up his mind that you're not going to do what he said. Keep that in mind. You are in charge. As long as you know how to use your weapons and have made up the mind in advance to handle a problem if necessary, you've got it linked. And I'd like you to bear that in mind because it has saved many people's lives up to now. I hope it won't happen to you, but if it does come to you, I hope it'll save your life.